because uh, yesterday Noam, Professor Noam Gavrieli uh, has uh, started this uh, talk and he said that uh, when he discussed with Mike the topic of his uh, presentation, he said he had two, more than one option and, uh, and that you have opted for, uh, for what he presented yesterday. Uh, that is in, in a way true in my case as well. I mean, especially given the, uh, the topics that were discussed yesterday, uh, since my, my own professional uh, sort of longer background has to do with the application of information technology, or more particularly with the application of decision support technologies, uh, which seems to be a very relevant topic in the, uh, in the uh, medical domain. So I'm sort of building into my, uh, my opportunities in, in future instances of this conference. That's comment number one. Comment number two is that the, um, the topic that I'm going to talk about, which expands the conversation to, um, to the, the manage, management of international business, has to sort of introduce us new language. But uh, given the fact that I've been, you know, recently I've been sitting and attending quite a few uh, conferences on medical technology, and uh, about 50% of the terms that are sort of so uh, quickly said with all kind of substances and, and procedures and uh, molecules of, of that kind and other sort of zipped by, zip by me. Uh, so I'll be fairly benign and I'll talk about a couple of concepts from the, uh, uh, from the area of uh, the management of international business. It'll be much easier to absorb, I think, than the uh, uh, the medical terms that, that I'll be using. But this is not a facetious comment. The, um, I think the meetings like the one that, that Mike has initiated uh, is a very interesting meeting place uh, of disciplines, of different languages, of people who look at the same problem from a very different uh, perspective. And my perspective is not medical. Uh, my perspective is business, more particularly the issue of uh, uh, using or viewing the, the problems that we've seen yesterday from a global perspective. That is sort of my take on, the, uh, on this issue. And, okay, the, uh, the rule that I've learned early on was to uh, <coughs> tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I will tell you, at the end I will tell you what I told you, and so by, you know, eventually we all know uh, what did I mean to say. So the synopsis of what I'm going to say. At the foreground, uh, it was very evident, uh, or it is quite evident, that the, uh, the economic dimension of the, uh, of the medical system is a, either worrisome, catastrophic in some other uh, scenarios, uh, but something that, uh, that's on, on the mind of many people, uh, even though, though uh, those who are dealing with, uh, with the medical issues uh, on, on sort of more directly. So we're looking, we're searching among other people, uh, large communities, at the uh, medical products, systems and services that are affordable. Now the, uh, the acronym P and S and S is the only one that I'm going to introduce again. It's uh, comparatively benign to the uh, kind of uh, acronyms that, uh, that the medical profession has bombarded us with uh, in the last few days. In, typical meeting. So that's the topic. And the question is, looking at the global opportunity to develop, to find uh, affordable medical product systems and services, the, um, the, the question is being asked as part of a larger study uh, that is uh, done here in this particular building. I don't know how many of you know what the uh, uh, Samuel Neyman Institute is, is about, but uh, some of you know much better than I do, uh, but the point is, uh, you know, trying to inform uh, practical area areas with uh, with research insight. That's sort of very broad statement of what uh, this, the, the institute is trying to do. Uh, and the question, the particular question that I'm going to address today, and I'll eventually describe the uh, the broader context, is uh, how to combine the relative strength of different medical technology clusters in the innovative design of radically less expensive medical product system and services. This is the question that we are pursuing. And in a way, those of you who 
sort of were here yesterday, my talk complements, in many ways, but uh, pun unintended, sort of completes the presentation of last of yesterday of uh, Rafi, Professor Rafi Bayer, Bayer, okay, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Because if you recall, his presentation was titled, you know, the, uh, the way in which Israeli uh, medical technology or medical uh, technology cluster can survive, uh, prepare, be ready for the global competition. Now, I listened very carefully, and what he basically spent almost most of the time was about the achievement, the, technology, the remarkable achievements of, uh, of his colleagues, of Rambam uh, Hospital and so on, talked very little about the, uh, the global perspective of, the, uh, of that activity. I'm going to do sort of the flip side of, the, uh, of that presentation. The reference to the medical domain will be uh, more by implication than, than directly because the, the body of knowledge that I'm going to, to address has to do with what we know today about the management of global businesses, of international business. So the, the language will be a business strategy and the, uh, the domain of, uh, of application is the, uh, the international or the global domain. So the question that we have phrased, and I'll explain later where it comes from, because it comes from conversation with our partners in India, uh, is dealing with the question of can we find or define opportunities uh, in the global arena to, um, to lower dramatically the cost. And the, 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 the issue is of dramatically the cost. Because yesterday, and again, I'll make comments about things or themes that were addressed uh, yesterday. People talked about the fact that gradual innovation is probably not the answer. Making yet, you know, marginally more uh, affordable product, that's not the issue, okay? People are doing that, it's done on a reasonably well uh, pace. The question is, can we, in some fresh thought, restructure the whole problem and get into uh, products and services and, uh, and, and, and the systems that are dramatically different in their cost implication? So that's the question that we have phrased. The, since this is you know, usually you say, well, this is work in progress. The uh, topic that I'm presenting is work before progress. So, in a way, most of what I'm going to talk about will be framing uh, the, uh, the research that we are conducting here. Okay, so that's sort of item number one. The, um, as I said, what we're seeking are change of fundamental cost structure. Now, thanks, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the good news is that uh, the medical profession is not, or the medical domain is not the only one uh, to seek that uh, uh, sort of different uh, cost structures. This is done in other businesses as well. And globalization has been a major force in, in this particular uh, pursuit. So the question is, how do you deal with it? And now I'm trying to introduce terms. Those uh, items in bold are uh, the things that I'm going to define later on. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to talk about global innovation, and I'll make it slightly more concrete. The problem with innovation is that it's very specious. It's very difficult to, uh, when you see, it's one of these things that philosophers say, when you, when you see it, you recognize it. But to define it explicitly is very different. That, that's why it's so difficult to manage it, because it's such a, uh, an entity which is not, uh, easy to, uh, to see, to define, to measure, uh, but it's very evident when it happens. So global innovation, I'll define that by going back to the sources and talk about what, what we consider innovation. It suffice to say at that point that innovation is doing things differently. And the question is, how do we do things differently? Global innovation has to deal with, given that the world is our paddle, uh, how can we do things differently given the opportunities that the world is, is providing us, okay? If you, for those of you who didn't wake up yet or sort of completely puzzled about what I'm talking about, okay, uh, let me give you an example which is very common uh, in the, sort of in the public, or sort of the common literature, or common journalism, is the question of outsourcing. <coughs> India, dividing the work that you do traditionally in one place 
and doing that in different places on Earth, exploiting differences in capacity, capabilities, cost in different places, okay, or exploiting other uh, advantages. Okay, so when you think of the world, and we'll, I'll give you a sort of a particular way to think about the world. Uh, doing things differently means looking at what you do, chopping it completely differently, trying to sort of divide the work in a way that the world is providing us with an advantage. Okay? I hope you're with me. Arbitrage. Arbitrage comes, the, um, uh, you know, the plain explanation of arbitrage, it comes from finance. It basically, you know, you don't have to do an MBA to, uh, to explain arbitrage. Arbitrage means buy low, sell high. So if you didn't get anything up to this point from the conference, you may write it down. This is a direct quote, okay? Buy cheap, sell expensively. That is the sort of the, 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 the most uh, brutal explanation of, of arbitrage, okay? If you talk about uh, arbitrage in finance, is basically if you can buy things in lower price and sell them at the higher price, okay? and the time difference between the two is very close, then this is the ideal situation of a financial arbitrage. Okay? Classical examples, working in a global environment, you buy certain equity, let's say in Hong Kong, and you sell it seconds later in New York. Uh, why I should take uh, you to the Far East? Let's talk about Israel. If you open uh, the newspaper Haaretz, on the page before last, you have the arbitrage uh, stocks, Israeli arbitrage stocks. The meaning is that, you know, the price in New York and the price in Tel Aviv stock exchange at the same time are slightly different. People who work on arbitrage would buy low and sell high, if possible, at the same place. There's a whole host of theory and, and procedures that deal with the, uh, that phenomena. And, you know, some of the major crashes in the financial history have been to, due to the fact that it was an arbitrage arbitrage gap that was sort of counterproductive and expanded, especially since people were able to trade with computers and, the, uh, uh, and to sort of do it very fast and expand the gap. Okay, so we have global innovation. Arbitrage, what does that mean? It means that I buy inexpensive, that's a common example, I, I'll relate to that later, inexpensive work uh, capacity in India and sell it immediately in another market where this, the worth of this one hour of work is much higher, okay? To think about that more structurally, we talk about the network of technology cluster. Cluster is a major concept in the understanding of the, of the world, and it helps us basically, instead of looking at the very, you know, rich and detailed world, to reduce it into small points or small number of points that allows us to argue more rationally about the, uh, the nature of arbitrage that I'm going to do because you have a network of these dots on the wall and the question is how you reduce the world into these particular points. Uh, clusters have been proposed uh, by uh, Michael Porter and is considered to be the uh, lingua franca of, uh, uh, of international management. So, the next point that I'm going to explain, once that I give you the, the big picture, I'll sort of close on the issue of a cluster, define a cluster more specifically. Technology and innovation cluster is a topic that recently has uh, received a significant attention. And Israel is, by the way, one cluster. You know, the people from the office of the chief scientists would like to think that, you know, three companies in a very nice park with the, you know, lawn and, and fence is a cluster. This is not a cluster in the global uh, analysis. Okay, Israel is considered to be a single cluster. And I'll sort of talk about that uh, in a few moments. Now that we know what is a cluster, the, uh, I'll, I'll, I will say some things about it, but very superficially because uh, it has been a major topic yesterday. Everybody who has been here yesterday, I'm sure was impressed by the significance, the size, the vitality, the uh, uh, prowess of the <coughs> of the Israeli innovation cluster. That'll be sort of the foreground. At that point, I'll switch and describe the, uh, our India-Israel innovation program within which 
the, uh, the attempt to understand all these issues has, uh, has been uh, occurring on, for a reason. Um, and as I said, this is one of the SNI, the Samuel Lehman uh, Institute missions, and that's uh, to inform Indo-Israeli or India-Israeli collaboration with research insights. We have a couple of projects. One of them has to do with the study of a possible India-Israel uh, collaboration to, to innovate uh, in the uh, medical space, uh, drug discovery, product design, development systems, and so on. Okay. So that's if you, uh, if you want to be able to talk intelligently in the afternoon about what this guy in the morning has said, you're pretty much safe. You can nap for a while. Uh, how much time do I have? Ten more minutes. Fine. Okay. So I'm glad I told you what I'm going to tell you because if I don't have enough time to tell you, you know what I wanted to tell you. Okay. Does that make sense? I don't know. Okay. So let's go on. The uh, global innovation. The uh, the emphasis on innovation and uh, you know we all talk mostly when we talk about innovation we focus on the product uh, dimension. Uh, so the introduction of a new good or new quality of goods considered to be the most obvious example of, uh, of innovation. So I'll switch forward. Uh, another line of innovation that people have been looking into is the introduction of a new method of production. Okay? So not just the product, but how you do that. Those who, and I'll try to give examples from the, uh, uh, from, from the medical domain to the extent that I know, if you have Nice examples to bring them up. Medinol. Medinol, dealing with the stent, the stent itself at that point was not a major uh, invention, but Medinol actually owned the process. The patent in Medinol is the process of production. It's not the, the device itself, or at least the, uh, the easy, to, uh, difficult to copy was the method. So the method was uh, the, the, the major product of innovation. Doing the same product, differently. In a way, what we try to do is even the products that we know in the medical domain, is there a way to chop it differently, to divide it into the digital part and the physical part and, uh, and do the digital part in India, uh, for example, and do the physical part in the, in the market itself, and by that combination achieving a different uh, quality or different uh, a price. Okay. That is basically what businesses are trying to do when they deal with globalization, and medical businesses as well. Another uh, sort of classical, easy to understand example of innovation is that you go to a new market, a geographical market, a segment, a new segment. We in the technology related to, that, to repurposing, namely you have an, a, a, an object that you try to sell or service, and then you discover that it's worth it has some value to audiences that you do not intend. Okay? The exercise of repurposing is very common in high tech because of the, the typical structure. They, you know, inventors are in love with that technology. They sort of focus on the technology. Eventually, they have a wonderful technology, and no one is willing to pay anything for that. So the question comes, who is willing to pay? And yesterday, we talked a lot about willingness to pay. That's item number one in business, business strategy is finding the willingness to pay. So another uh, uh, sort of source of innovation, again, less intuitive, is the, um, the discovery of new sources of, uh, of supply of raw materials, or it was at, at the original, it was half manufactured, but let's see, partially manufactured. Okay? Teva, for example, does it very nicely in the, uh, in the, in the processes. The, the substances that are below FDA are done in all sorts of plants that are well below FDA standards, okay? And, you know, up to that point, and what's under FDA standards is done in Amat Chovar. So they look at the process that was originally thought of a monolithic process, and then divide it to sub-FDA, under FDA, or sort of below FDA standards, or above FDA standards, FDA standards and divided that in the wall to have the, the advantage. The uh, final one, and the most challenging, and the one that I'm really uh, pointing to, is the rethinking of the business model. Okay. Thinking of the, the functions that you have to perform, and think where do you allocate them in the world? 
What's the, where's the best place to do that? And we see, we, we in Israel are target of, of that thought and the, the, you know, the development of the establishment of research centers, of Pfizer or Merck recently in, in, in Israel, is basically a result of thinking, where should I get the highest value of research capacity uh, in the world and deciding to do that here. I obviously did not invent it. Uh, you'll be, uh, you might be surprised to identify the, uh, the time. Josef Schumpeter, the uh, economist, the sort of innovation economist, uh, was neglected, had a, was considered to be a marginal economist for many years uh, while he was touting uh, in the 20s and the 30s already that the only source of value uh, in our economy is innovation. And uh, at that time it was not popular. Today we appreciate that much better. The whole issue of innovation is, uh, raises multidisciplinary uh, concerns and I'll deal with them uh, briefly as we go along. So this is about innovation. How do you uh, deal with, how do you bring in the global thing? So the world, I don't know if you uh, noticed, you sort of stopped on your way to the, uh, to the conference to, to see the world. The world is very rich, okay? They have a lot of details. It has a lot of nuances. Uh, Tom Friedman has been saying for a couple of years, uh, you know, actually for the last seven years in the Lex and the, uh, and the olive tree first and then later in the, the world is flat. He discovered, he called his wife, Anne, excited and tells her that the world is flat in 2005 and then later, in the later book in 2006. Yes, the world is flat, but, uh, but it's cracked. So we all know that uh, we can reach all sorts of places. We can, uh, we can easily get to places, either digitally or, or physically, but the world is not unified, is not homogeneous, thank God. Okay, there's a lot of differences among places. So the question is, how do we start to argue uh, about international global policy of a company or of a cluster or a nation uh, intelligently. So the, uh, to our help comes the notion of a cluster. So what you do, what you see here uh, on this uh, page is uh, pretty much, yeah, and, and usually it raises a lot of, uh, people are sort of uh, shouting at that stage and so on, but this is early in the morning, so I don't uh, see too much excitement here. Uh, this is a pretty accurate view of technology clusters in the world today. I may have missed one or two. Uh, you know, when I talk to people in the medical domain, they say Oxford uh, is a cluster. Now, a cluster, that I'll define later, has to do with some critical mass. Two companies somewhere are not a cluster, not even three. You have to have a body, okay? You have to have capacity, you have to have a, a sort of a, a con concentration of capacity of various types. The classical example is Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is the epitome of clusters. And the ana all analysis of clusters actually started from trying to understand why Silicon Valley has become what we call Silicon Valley. Okay. So the, the US is now reduced to about three major clusters. And there's always an argument, and when I give it in different places, then they argue that uh, their place is also a cluster. You know, generally speaking, Route 28, Austin, Texas, uh, Silicon Valley are the three significant clusters. Israel is a single cluster. This is India, Gurgaon, Noida, uh, in the, near Delhi, Pune, and Mumbai is, is one. Hyderabad uh, with a, a medical, rel medically relevant technology. Uh, obviously, Bangalore as, as a major uh, cluster. Chennai is growing up, okay? Could be considered cluster. Uh, especially in the automotive uh, technology. China is another one uh, with Taiwan obviously as a sort of the renegade province uh, attached to it. Shenzhen, Shenzhen, depending which part of China you are coming from, is a, sort of another story. Uh, interestingly enough, India and China started about the same time, 91, uh, with two critical uh, events uh, in their history. Tokyo for consumer electronics, Osaka for robotics, that's pretty much it. I may have missed one, we can argue back and forth. It's important, the concession is important, because what you're actually looking at is you go back to Porter and you try to do the analysis. Did I reach 
critical mass in any, any other place. Okay? Now, what we see here is a global open economic architecture and its network of networks. I want to sort of point out that within each one of them you see three elements. Okay? So we have, this is the global network, and inside each one we have a local network uh, that I'll talk in a moment. So that, that's the world. Now we can start talking. Now it's the time that you can you know, take your company and say, okay, if that's the world, how do I manage and design my work around that concept? And, uh, okay, uh, I'll get to that. You look at the clusters. As I said, Silicon Valley is the ultimate. Uh, it's open economic network. The nodes inside that I just started to talk about are three. And you don't have a cluster before you have three layers in place, okay? And the layers are the tech companies, so primary technology companies, you have investors. These are the sort of the crucial elements. Before you have that, you cannot declare a uh, con conglomeration or a concentration of companies as a, as a legitimate cluster. Then, you know, the second tier or second strata is uh, subcontractors, uh, professional services. You can do that on your own. If you have in the cluster subcontractors where you can uh, outsource the, the, uh, the manufacturing of some parts, it means easier, faster, less uncertainty. Okay? Remember, this is innovation cluster. So what we're actually is looking at is an economic architecture that reduces risk. Okay. Oh, you got a new watch. Are you show me in the middle of the, my presentation? Okay. <laughs> For the highest bidder? Okay. The third element uh, is, uh, is universities and government, universities for, for sources of knowledge and, uh, on, and people, government for intervention, uh, research, subsidies, and so on and so forth. Okay? So we have local networks that are the individual clusters and the network of cluster, global clusters. There is a funny law that defines clusters as sort of from end to end, it's two hours of driving distance. The, the joke says that the VCs don't travel uh, longer to see uh, companies. Uh, but you know, you know, empirically speaking, it works. Okay. When did the Israeli cluster become a cluster, by the way? Does anyone know? The year of, we had a lot of technology for a long time. You know, some of the pioneers are in the audience. We became a cluster in 94. What happened in 94? Yosma. Okay. We uh, the, the missing part was the uh, uh, availability of, of money. Okay. And the uh, the VC industry was sort of single the sort of single strike created 1994. And uh, that uh, from that on we are cluster, and therefore we have better restaurants today and more wine to choose from, and so on and so forth. Basically speaking, a cluster, as I said, lowers the risk for innovation and technology entrepreneurship. You have that, you know you can some you have some assurance of success. There's a lot of books you can see that will be eventually posted on the on the website. There's a lot of thought behind it. Okay, company, company looks at that, start to make the argument, and here's an example of um, ICT. That's my background uh, in a multinational company. It could be Converse for that purpose. It could be uh, a company that does uh, a medical uh, equipment or or, uh, or service where headquartered could be in, in Boston, design could be done in Israel, uh, development in Bangalore makes a lot of sense, and service to Japan in Dalia. Okay, why in Dalia? It was under uh, uh, Japanese uh, occupation in the, in the Second World War with all the atrocities and so on. They left behind a lot of lang language skills. So if the, the outsourcing today to, for service centers to Japan is Dalia. Okay, also ISCAR and also other uh, interesting enterprises, but basically this is sort of the, <coughs> the, the advantage. The, uh, and by the way, the network is dynamic because companies in Bangalore now outsource to Xi'an. You do, so they outsource work that was done in Bangalore before. It's cheaper to do it in Xi'an. Eventually it'll be cheaper to do it in Malaysia, okay, or elsewhere in the world. And I'll make a comment about that in, as I fast close my, my comments. 
So the question that a company sees or enterprise sees, medical or non-medical, is to how do I identify sticky resources? Sticky resources are resources that don't travel well. And they, they can be found in Bangalore, but it's easy to replicate it or get it elsewhere. Okay? And you translate it to competitive advantage. And there's a whole notion of you know, what do you do in, in the, uh, the far parts of your company? Are you just operating? Are you mobilizing resources? Or are you learning? This is a topic that I will not be able to get into. But the question is, do allow yourself to, end, to learn at the periphery or just in the center? This may not sound to you as a major issue, but it turns out to be uh, something that distinguishes companies like Cisco from, uh, from others in my particular domain, where you know, products can grow up in Bangalore and become global products and managed from Bangalore, even though the center of the company is uh, somewhere in California. Okay. The, uh, key, so what, what is the company trying to do? I talked about utilizing and identifying the, uh, the sticky resources, building the network, Coping with the dynamics, it moves on. It was one in Bangalore, and now it's Xi'an, so you cannot rest on the laurels, and structuring that for that effect. What is the, clus the, the cluster? Okay. Credibility. You have to be credible. And the cre don't stay behind. The, the, the typical example in this particular case is one here in the, the quality certification. India has invested huge amounts in certification. So the uh, CMM levels four and five for those of you in the IT, uh, where if you're in the US and you don't know what these sort of exotic people are doing, then they can say, I got CMM level four, which is the highest level sort of a professional standard, then it gives you some reassurance. In terms of example here, Ireland. Ireland was a haven for uh, call centers, stops pretty much here, never grew beyond that, was stuck. Now, call center is not a very attractive place to work, and eventually it loses the attraction. For India, it became, it was still attractive, but they were pushing ahead. So think of us as a cluster. You know, we are in a very particular place, probably here. The question is what do we, our policy makers, have to, uh, to do in order to preserve them. The, uh, you can, it's sort of obvious, the, uh, the, I would just want to mention the NRX role. These are sort of the non-resident Indians, Israelis, Irish, non-resident Chinese, non-resident Finns. We've done our studies in all sorts of places. And they are boundary spanners, for those of you who know the management literature. Okay? The question is, you know, how do you enforce the wealth or the health of the, of the cluster? Okay? And other key uh, factors in public policy is the, how do you help entrepreneurs cut the red tape? Okay? And you have your own sort of examples. I'm not sure that Israel provides a lot. And uh, I'll, as I said, this was discussed a lot yesterday. Uh, I'll just highlight one point here, which is the, uh, the fact that we're globally born. Okay? Our startups are globally born, and that's a concept that starts to attract a lot of attention. Uh, when you talk about India and China or, or the US, you, cannot, you don't have to be globally born. Okay? Born globally enterprises immediately think of them as operating globally, and uh, that is one of the advantages we have. As I said, it's part of a larger uh, attempt to inform the Indian-Israeli relationship, which the uh, SNI has taken upon itself. We have a lot of projects. One project that we're dealing with is the one that I implied by what I said, and that's leveraging Indo-Israeli relative strength in the pharma, biotech, uh, that's been the discussion so far. Uh, Areas of particular interest, uh, generic pharma where Israel is sort of excelling, medical information that some people think that we are uh, doing relatively well on that, and clinical trials, again, dealing with a variety of uh, genes in India. It's part of a larger attempt, and again, you can get impression from the, uh, uh, from the website. Uh, this is a sort of example of you know, relative strength. India, very good at design. Israel at, R, at research, a local market in India is, is impressive. It has huge global presence in the Fortune 500. Uh, we are more equipped to deal with the EU. So you start to build the puzzle in the company. I'm almost done. Uh, okay. So what I wanted to tell you is that in the search for affordability, uh, we should look at the world. 
the tools to think about the, the, the problem and will seek arbitrage. Uh, the cluster is our unit of thought. Israeli Innovation Cluster, thank God, and that's our sort of sheer luck, if you will, uh, is uh, impressive and well regarded. It is not a, something that will last forever. Okay? That, if we know anything about that, is the dynamics of the story. Okay? If it's not, it will be maintained and, and, and kept well, it will uh, become irrelevant. Some people in India quote between five, seven, maybe ten years before, we will not be a relevant partner to India. So that's the window of opportunity that we have vis-a-vis -vis India that will eventually get the innovation capacity and so uh, with respect to China. So the time to act is, is now and we in our study would like to help that, uh, to be based on insights rather than intuition alone. Sorry Thank for you. the time that I've taken. Thank you, Gadi. Since we have a, a discussion session uh, at the end of the presentations, uh, I'd like to keep the questions and discussion to then, so we we'll, uh, almost immediately carry on to the next presentation. Uh, I do want to, however, add one point. There was a time in my career I was a cost reduction engineer. That was my job. And I took the basic product that we had, and I used to find some way to save a little bit here and save a little bit there, and, you know, we cut costs. Uh, a whole different perspective of cutting costs uh, came here where we start thinking about open innovation, colleges and networks and outsourcing, etc., etc. We moved to a whole different place. And what we didn't hear from Gary in a film uh, is that we're also moving in the world from where our focus of innovation and product was the top of the pyramid, right? And as we move down the pyramid, a number of things happen. The nature of the problem has changed. What's required for a, a solution changes. Scale changes enormously. The reason I yesterday talked about the cataract thing is that the innovation wasn't really in coming up with a you know, acuter uh, lens. It was realizing that you were going to be doing millions of cataract surgeries instead of hundreds of cataract surgeries. And I think we have to begin thinking about the changing world where we're dealing with very different parameters, right? Where uh, the, the need for low-cost products have a whole new meaning, right? And so I'd like to just add that to the discussion. But I think in a sense our next speaker, uh, Ron, will give us a dimension of that because he's going to be talking about the whole growing uh, market for silver, older, I'd like to call ourselves gold. <coughs> uh, population is growing and so on. I have to tell you why we're settling down. It's a small world we live in, and Ron and I and Chaya met for a, a lunch of some months ago, and realized that like 30 years ago, he had purchased her apartment in the Chobot. <laughs> Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mike, for inviting me. Uh, first, uh, I would like to uh, give a little bit background uh, to this uh, topic, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, my early profession was uh, an industrial designer. And uh, when my mother and father became old, I discovered that there's a whole world of needs that is not uh, being answered with proper answers. And uh, so I migrated into this area of uh, developing and designing products that would be suitable for my parents and others. Um, <clears throat> judging by the hair color of the audience, I suppose that most people will know exactly what I will be talking about and I will not tell you in advance what I will be talking about. I would like to start with uh, two little anecdotes. My mother who is uh, 86 decided that she is going to try and 
use the computer, which she obviously never has done before. And after she had her first lesson, she came to me and she said, Ron, you know, there's something that really puzzles me. When I want to shut down my computer, I have to go to start. Interesting logic. <laughs> Another thing that I want to share with you is my own experience, and probably everybody has bought a book or something on the internet, and after you finish the whole uh, money transaction, you have to add in also your birth date. So, with the day and the month, there's no problem. But once you have to put in the year, you scroll once, you scroll twice, you scroll three times, then you decide that you're probably dead by now. <laughs> and somewhere down there, you find 1946, which is my birth date. Usually, when we think about next generation medical pro uh, products and systems, we usually think of very advanced technology, huge scanners, cameras, gray colors, very, very sophisticated design, very elaborated. And uh, anybody who is in this business knows that is what we call the medical design look and feel. I would like to start with a very, very low-end product. It's a medical product in a way. This is a little device invented by a <coughs> young Singaporean designer and its sole purpose is to help people to put eye drops in their eyes. Now I suppose that each one of the people who is sitting in this audience, and myself included, we have this experience of trying to put one drop in our eyes, and we have this anxiety when this drop will drop down. Very simple. Centers the <coughs> bottle, the, the bottleneck right into the middle of the eye. Very nice. In so many words, this is what I will be talking about. It will be talking about this meeting point between a product and a user, and it might be a user who has some difficulties. So, I think I can say with based on my own experience as a designer for many years and knowing what's going on, it seems that we tend to forget who it is made for. And uh, unfortunately, my uh, fellow colleagues, we, we are pushed many times to do a design or to give a solution that will look good. And look good is not enough. So I would like to, uh, since the topic of my, uh, my speech is how to turn silver into gold, I would like to give some hard facts about what's going on in this market. So first of all, and this is something I always say in all my presentations, the beginning of the 21st century marks the end of the period of human history with more young people than old. And for the rest of human history, there are going to be more older people than young. And that's already a fact. If you are looking on uh, what's going on in the world, basically in Western Europe and in the United States, most of the countries in Western Europe we have a negative birth rate and a growth of longevity of people because of good medicine, good living conditions, and um, we are 
marching very safely into a period where about more than 25% of the population in Europe, Western Europe, will be over the age of 65. Uh, <clears throat> North America will not be far from that. Numbers are very, very impressive. We are talking about a lot of tens, and tens of millions of people who are at a certain age where things are not as they used to be. When we're talking about aging, we're talking about changes in the cardiovascular systems, <coughs> respiratory systems, muscular systems, skeletal, nervous systems, gastro, endocrine, and uh, cognitive system. I know that most of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I will jump right into this diagram, which my students call the depression diagram. My, my students here at the Technion, they are graduate students, they are more or less around their 30s, and when they see that, they call it depression diagram. Well, this is what's going on. We are talking about the decline of the working memory, speed of processing, short-term memory, long-term memory. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the interesting part of it is that at the age of 55 to 65, we are more than halfway done. Now, I know that most people, when they are 55 or even 65, don't feel old. Definitely not today. Uh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Some are here, but you, you're pro uh, since I know you, I know you're working. No, not at all. By the way, one of the best way, one of the best way to change this is doing Tai Chi. So whoever does it, it's good. Whoever doesn't, start. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, what's, what's very important about it, this is something that, uh, that uh, is very important to understand, is that people in the ages of 55 and 65, as I said, do not consider themselves old. And what is worse, they think they can do much more than they really can. And here we are stepping into a danger zone. One thing that grows better is the verbal capacity. So, it's something to look forward to. Uh, I'll, I'll go on to, uh, to depress you a bit. And we're talking about hearing impairments. And uh, for all those people who are designing medical devices that have beeps, and, and things, a lot of old people do not hear the, ter the, the beeps of the thermometer, etc., etc., etc. This is a diagram that describes the, the, the visual uh, impairments, which is very well known to most of the people at younger ages, 50 to 54, when we say the arms are growing short, and this, is the, this diagram is actually showing what happens to our reading ability, and most of us solve it with glasses. But basically, once we're down at the age of 54, it basically stays that way. So, but there are other things. So, uh, <clears throat> when we are talking about um, uh, about uh, uh, visual ability, we are talking about uh, uh, a decline in to see details, to focus on near objects, to discriminate differences between levels of contrast, to adapt to changes in brightness. Those of you who go to the computer when they wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning and they, when the screen starts, whew, you get it right into your face. I know it happens to me. This is exactly what I'm talking about, but this change between uh, strong light and soft light is, could be very dangerous, for instance, when driving in tunnels and so on. Uh, uh, mild impairment in color vision and depth perception. And then we have, of course, age-related diseases that have to do with eyesight. It's uh, cataract and AMD, and I'm not going to go into that. 
uh, speed of uh, reaction. We did uh, some very interesting experiments uh, at our program here at the Technion. By the way, most of the students want me to be their tutor in the research studies. They know already that if you want Ron, you just choose something that has to do with all the people and he'll accept you. <laughs> so, so one of the things was uh, that we gave uh, uh, people, uh, young people, young sub subjects and old subjects to uh, uh, command, press the green button, and then there was not a big difference between the, the subjects. But once we gave them a note, which was folded in four, and in the note was written, press the green button, you see the differences. Now, the difference between, for instance, somebody who broke a leg and is impaired temporarily or even permanently is that he has one problem. When we are talking about aging, we are talking about a collection of a lot of problems that have a lot of influence on one another. And uh, one of the things which is quite uh, well known is in most cases it doesn't get better. It could be, it could stay at a certain position or get worse. So, <clears throat> In the reality of products, including medical products, including websites, including information, including telephones, mobile phones, whatever you want, we have hardware interface, we have software interface, we have uh, instructional support, which is the manual book. You know, we all get with the, every product we buy, we get a book of 360 pages with uh, very, very small letters written in a language that only engineers can understand. And then we have our capabilities, which is uh, sensory, perceptual, cognitive, and motor abilities. And what happens is that the demand permanently presses on the capability of the user. And by now you know that as people age, their capabilities reduce. So, if I would add to this some animation, probably the yellow one would grow and be large and heavy and press down the other one. <clears throat> In surveys on the use of products and services, 47% of the problems reported by older adults were due to financial limitations, health difficulties, or other general concerns. We have another 53% who would prefer a product or a service designed to fit their needs and provided with suitable training. Now I have this little story about suitable training. And if there is somebody in the audience who heard me last year, I, I told this story, but I think it's so nice that I really would like to repeat it. My wife and I bought a new washing machine about two years ago. We had a very stupid Maytag, American Maytag machine, you know, those huge monsters, which was very stupid. You just press a button, it, after 20 minutes, it, the laundry is done. That's it. And then my wife came and she said, you know, I've seen that my friends, there's this very advanced machine that, you know, you can do hand washing it and so and so on. Okay, that's why, it, you know, the Maytag was 23 years old, still working. So, so we bought a very advanced, state-of-the-art, digital washing machine made in Germany. And Ron, who is a professor at the Technion, and my wife, who is a PhD from Stanford, were sitting on the bus stop with the instruction manual, trying to figure out how to make another rinse. <laughs> I tell you, it took us 20 minutes. Because we were ashamed to call the service. Because, you know, after you know it's, it's simple. And 
And since then, whenever I talk to, uh, to companies, I tell them, listen, the people who are going to buy your products in the next years will be people like me. Because they have the money, they are in a period which they would really like now to pamper themselves, they buy new houses because the old one is too big, they buy a new kitchen, they buy new home appliances, and then they have to understand how to operate it. And, you know, by word of mouth, you get either make or break, because I will tell my friends that I have difficulties with products, and so on and so on. And the funny part about it is that you don't have really to go into technology, hardware, and stuff like that. You can just, you know, you hire a designer who will do the job for you. It's the cheapest part of working on a product, especially in Israel. Anybody who is in the industry knows you. Pick up the phone, you call a designer or three, you work a little bit on pricing, and then for a couple of thousands you have the work done. So why not? You just have to be aware of it. So I know what means the excitement and the complexity of developing a new product. I'm an entrepreneur myself. The last thing you really think about or want to think about is about that particular customer who is over 55. You know, I, was, I had a meeting with the Vice President of Creative in Singapore, and I discussed with him the possibility to develop an MP3 player for the baby boomers. You know, huge market, they grew up with Woodstock, they grew up with music, Beatle music, Rolling Stones, etc. They would love to have a good MP3 player that they can handle. But most MP3 players are suitable for Korean girls at the age of 12 with very tiny fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so are cell phones. Just to give you a very rough impression, what do we think of when we are working on developing a new product or, uh, or upgrading a product or a service to be suitable for people who are over the age of 55. And there are so many things. Sometimes people ask me, what, what do you do? You know, you do a lot of workshops about, for designers about aging. What do you do? And my usual answer is, I teach young people to think old. Because young people cannot think old unless they are forced to. And one of my favorite exercises is that they have to wrap masking tape around their fingers so they are not able to, to operate their hands as they used to. And then I send them to the toilet to take off their trousers. The girls I send to the toilet to try and open their bras. They go to the vending machine. They have to bring me a Coke, etc., etc. And they come completely disappointed. They say, but it's impossible. You know, I dropped the coin. I couldn't lift it up. I say, yes. Yes. This is exactly what happens. This is exactly what happens because this collection of words is not just, it's not there just to impress you, to say, look how much. Because, for instance, joint swelling is something very common even in younger ages than 55. And it is painful. This is a quote that I heard from a lady who is head of... Uh, uh, 
user interface in HP. And I love it because this is exactly what I preach for. Because obviously, most people, most designers, most engineers, most people who are in the business of developing products and marketing products are not aware because they don't know. And what they don't know is really what they should know. Because if you want to turn silver into gold, you have to find out. It's a huge market there. And speaking about medical products, I just want to mention something. You know, we always say about the home user, the one who will do distant medicine and so and so. Doctors are not so young anymore. Average age of doctors in the United States is 57, 58. Average age of nurses is 48 to 50. And they have to operate a lot of complicated stuff. And there was a very interesting article about a year ago uh, <clears throat> that was written about a very, very elaborated and sophisticated software that was developed for American hospitals to deal with drug administration in the hospital. And the title of the article was finishes his report, and then it's now 12.10 or 12.15, and then he has to write some information about the drugs. So he writes, but he doesn't remember that he's already in tomorrow. So he writes, tomorrow, give him this and this and this. So this patient came out of surgery room and for 24 hours does not get any medicines. Of course, they, meant they, they found out and they dealt with it. But those things, because there is this gap between the people who are in the, develop, in the research and development who are obviously younger, and they have to develop products that are also must be suitable for people who are older. I would like to give you an example product launched recently in the market and it's not from the medical uh, field. I deliberately didn't want to go into that. This is a washing machine. Now I told you earlier about our washing machine. I tell you something, if there is a sock stuck in the washing machine, you know, at the end of the drum, that means you have to bend down about that high. And there you see the sock somewhere there. So. <coughs> First of all, they made a washing machine which is taller. So, you, first of all, you have eye contact with what is inside the washing machine, and you can have a much easier reach. The controls, besides not using engineering terms, they even selected a design that is very much resembling a turning knob of an old-style cooker. It's a language that those people understand much better. Because we know, my students do researches about it all the time, about perception of icons and visual language and the gap. So, if you want to address the silver generation, you have to talk with them a language which they grew up with. And as you can see, she's happy. And then, of course, what I always say is, when you design for the young, you exclude the older. When you design for the older, you include the young, which is a nice thing to remember. And I think this is it. Should be a thank you. Uh, some three more words for wrapping up. In most cases, when I talk to companies, talking about aging is not perceived in our society as sexy. 
we are a generation where people go to the gym, they go to the beach, they try to look as young as possible, we worship uh, youth, and especially the, the generation of, uh, of the baby boomers, they try to dress like their kids, and they try to keep young, and they want to have this kind of lifestyle. So when you're talking about aging, it's not something very sexy. But I will not bring the numbers. There are people much better than me in talking about numbers. We are talking about millions and millions and millions and millions, and it's big, 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 big business. So uh, please, 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 anybody who is in the development of new products, Look into it. It's important and it's good business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. And we didn't have to get all the way to the end. So that's very interesting. Thank you. And we will do the discussion in a while. <clears throat> now let me call on another aspect of what happens to people. And uh, Shmuel Shani will talk about some very interesting evolutions in the rehabilitation areas. Is that supposed to do? It's, uh, the, the idea are not confidential, only the presentations. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for, um, for the very nice presentations we had before because they really lead us to this uh, almost like a case report, which really prove the messages that we have just heard. Uh, the main shareholders of NES, NES is a private company, and the main share shareholders, as you can see here, are Teuza, which is a venture fund that is a product of what we have just heard, the, the, uh, the time when Israel became a cluster of um, technology, and uh, Teruza was the one to recognize the potential in the market that we've just heard about, namely the market of the older people, but more specifically, people with disabilities. And uh, the Dow Chemical Company joined uh, later as a strategic partner for uh, manufacturability, again, because they have also recognized the huge field here and the important role which they can play in this field together with us. And then later on, Alfred Mann uh, joined forces with us and I'll talk about it later. The company developed a technology, a unique technology in uh, a junction between functional electrical stimulation, the neurological rehabilitation, and exoskeleton. I will explain uh, now what each of these First, the neurological rehabilitation, uh, I think each of you have seen maybe somebody from the family or somebody who, who you know that have gone through rehabilitation. You know that uh, rehabilitation is a very, very long process of people to come from a certain disability to, a less, uh, to being less dependent and less disabled. However, the unique uh, phenomena and maybe sad phenomena about this field is that if you compare this field of uh, neurological rehabilitation to the field of, uh, of uh, uh, the cardio field or the uh, orthopedic field, you find out that while a lot of technology, high technology, was added to these fields which I mentioned, there is no high technology in the field of rehabilitation. That could be a phenomena that has to do with, the, with how the uh, society looked at the older people. That could be for some other reasons. But the, the, the truth is that if uh, a physiotherapist who would have uh, uh, slept for 100 years would wake up today, uh, he or she would feel very comfortable in the rehab center. There is no high technology in rehab centers. And basically, NES come to address this phenomena, and we would like to challenge it. And our vision is to take the rehab field, 
maybe it will take us five year, more years, but to bring the rehab field to where we today see the cardio field, the orthopedic field, etc. Speaking about functional electrical stimulation, which is again one of the core businesses that where we developed our technology, uh, what it has to do is the ability of this technology is to move uh, muscles and to, to regain movement with electrical stimulation. This technology is very old. However, the use of this technology uh, was very, very limited because it involved wiring the people in a manner that is not practical. It is so unpractical that even in rehab centers, you don't do it a lot. If you go to 10 rehab centers, nine of them may not be doing it because they will tell you that the person who knows how to do it uh, just changed and uh, moved away and etc. And they don't know how to find the dots and they don't know how to connect the person. But and some do and some don't. But definitely it is not something which is used at home uh, in a wide, uh, with, a, with a wide range of use. What we did is exactly what we have just uh, heard here in this lecture. We said, how do we take this technology and bring it into this field of rehabilitation, knowing that we deal with older people in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases. We deal with people with disabilities that not only that they remember less and less and they see less and less, as we've just heard, they also paralyzed Sometimes half of the body is paralyzed. Sometimes their, um, their uh, cognition is, is much less. And we have to develop the technology in such a way that the technology will be self-contained. From their perspective, it should be very, very simple. Just touch the button and it works. Furthermore, we're not talking here about a wash machine or even not a cell phone which is always in our pocket. We're talking about devices which are worn by the people on their body through the rest of the day. So it becomes part of their, it's like, it's like a shirt, it's like a dress. But uh, a sophisticated dress which involves a lot of technology in it and it should work for them everywhere they go and should be very, very simple for them to operate. So the development of these devices, as you can see here, uh, became to be the vision of the company, namely to, to uh, develop a product for every, uh, para every site which is paralyzed. That could be for the shoulder, for the arm, for the hand, thigh, leg, etc. And all of these products have a unique feature that everything is self-contained. You just press a button and it should work. When I say work, uh, first I would like to have one word about how we develop it. There is no way to do all what I have just described up until now, just by theory. Because the theory would bring you to a product that people, as we have just heard, would look in the menu and would not even know how to operate. We develop the products together with the patients themselves. We have uh, dozens of patients in Israel, uh, Sweden, US, Holland, and, and some other countries who work with us on developing the products. The patients themselves are the only one with whom you can develop these products on a daily basis. Why do we need patients all over the world? Because of cultural differences. A person in Israel may use the, the device in a different way than a person in Sweden. Uh, and, and we have seen it all along. Also, the people are very different in their, in their, in the, in their um, body, in their body sizes. As you know, uh, in Sweden you can find very, very large people uh, with very large hands, for instance, while uh, uh, in some other countries you have sometimes much smaller ones. And in a minute I will show you how big is this market. And in order to address it in an industrial way, uh, we need to uh, make a product which is kind of one size fits all, almost. Otherwise we have not done anything. If we do something that would take hours to fit and hours to change for every person, then this is not a product to, uh, to, to go into mass production. And our idea is to go into mass production. So we develop it with the patients uh, with a lot of, of practical 
uh, experience and practical knowledge which comes from the patient and they become basically our uh, site for development. The first product which we developed that way was uh, called the Ness H200. It's a product which brings back function to paralyzed limbs. Uh, the, the product with the FDA clearance needs a therapist to be fitted, but it's a very short session. As you know, a, therapy, uh, a normal therapy session is, say, 45 minutes, so we must make sure that within a few, say, 20 minutes, the person would understand it all. There is not a lot to understand, as I said before, just to press the button. Go home and start using the device. And when I say start using the device, each of our devices have three benefits, each very different from each other. The first one, which you see clearly in, this, in these pictures, is a functional benefit. Namely, on, on the upper left uh, picture, you see a person who is a spinal cord injured per patient. Without the device, he has no movement and no ability to grasp, hold, or release with his hand. And with the device, the person regains the ability to eat, to drink, and he can put uh, back the fork, he can take uh, a glass and drink, he can even write, and he can do every, uh, every uh, task which involves grasp, hold, and release. That is pure function. Uh, and you can see it also here with a few other examples. However, the other benefit is the therapeutic benefit. Because at least, not at least, with the spinal cord injury less, but much more so in the case of stroke uh, and a CVA, in that case, the injury is in the brain. So if a person would use a device like that for a long time, a long time might be a year, two years, and more than three years, then certain amount of function will come back to the limb without the device. And that is based on the well-known phenomena of brain plasticity. So the brain basically relearn and develop uh, path pathways uh, to overcome the uh, injured area. With children and young people, this phenomena is very, very strong. Uh, in cases of children, if, even if half of the brain is cut, within three months, uh, the other half may take most of the functions from the, for, from the so there are no more uh, have paralysis in half of the body. With adults, it's much less so, so uh, but it takes more time, but it, it is there. So the therapeutic effect of, uh, of these devices is very important. And the third element, the third benefit, is the prevention, because the paralysis itself, even though it is a very, very terrible event, is not the whole story. The story starts from there, where deterioration continue. And because of the paralysis, people develop spasticity, pain, contractures, uh, edema, and, and skin problems. All of these, uh, uh, all of these um, uh, could be prevented if people use devices to bring back movement and function uh, to their limbs. Uh, we also have a project which does similar ideas to children, and that was developed together with Johnson & Johnson Company and uh, the uh, Bird Foundation, which you all know about. Um, the second product which we developed on the same idea and the same method, so I will not have to repeat, is as a product to to allow people who has paralysis in their foot to walk like normal people. And as you know, sometimes because of the stroke or the uh, spinal cord injury, the, the paralysis is such that the person does not have movement anymore uh, uh, on the foot. It's called foot drop. And by placing a device like that under the knee of the patient, and by placing a uh, sensor under the heel, everything is, uh, is working here on a wireless basis, which, by the way, is a challenge in our world because you know that, uh, that our environment is full of uh, all kinds of, um, of wireless signals. Uh, and when we are talking about walking, we have to make sure that the protocol is strong enough to protect the, uh, the gate 
uh, movement from all these uh, noises around, otherwise the person may fall just because he was walking down an uh, antenna of television or something like that. So that has all built in into this uh, unique protocol which we had to develop because uh, the wireless which we all use to, to uh, open the car is not, say, is not good for that purpose. Um, and uh, the vision uh, of our company has then been to uh, turn this technology into what we call a standard of care. Uh, because today's standard of care in, uh, in, um, in, in the medical field is something which, at least in the industrial world, is giving as a standard to the patients. Uh, and that is basically the, uh, the end goal of bringing a technology to the market. In order to do that, you know, in medical devices, we had to do studies with the FDA. The FDA has run with us certain studies in the home of patients in the U.S., and they all proved that the devices work well for them, and we cleared it with the FDA. And now, as again, as we heard in the previous lecture, the market is very, very big. Um, it is amazing how big it is. Uh, what you see here is just the number of devices which can, which can uh, uh, be uh, sold in the industrial world, namely in, um, in the uh, US, uh, uh, in Europe, and Japan, that's it. And in this world alone, if you take devices for the hand, for the leg, all these devices which I mentioned before, and for the various indications like stroke on the very left uh, up, and the uh, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, Christopher Reeves, as you all remember, is a spinal cord injury, CP, these are the children, etc. So we are talking about a potential market of 20 million devices. 20 million devices currently on the market, which every year, unfortunately, uh, renew themselves by about 8 or 10 percent because new people come. Uh, that's a huge market, and we sell uh, one product for $6,000. So we're talking about over $100 billion market potential. But let's, uh, let's admit that it is not really a market. This is a need. A market is where people know that they need something and they want to buy and pay. That's a market. This is only a need. These people, these millions of people, don't know that they can be benefit from these devices. The doctors don't know. Thousands and thousands of doctors all over the world don't know about this technology uh, because they haven't heard my lecture. So the, the, uh, the, challenge, the challenge here is how to take a technology, as I said before, which have never been and never existed in this field, and how to tell everybody that we are going to change this field and to uh, almost like reinvent, uh, reinvent this field. As, so we cleared it, we cleared all of our products with the FDA. We came up with uh, two different markets to which we also developed two different type of products. One market is the rehabilitation uh, centers, which is a huge market by itself. And the other market are the people at home whom we want to use the devices at home. But we have to start with the rehabilitation centers because in the medical field, people don't judge by themselves if the product is good or not. They judge by what the doctor and the rehab center say, and they, they judge by the, uh, by the uh, insurance company. If the insurance company pay, probably it's a good product. This is a phenomenon by itself because I think in the first lecture we heard about uh, the, the question was, um, how do we reduce the prices of the medical devices? And I can tell you that the, it's not only the issue of price, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of perception. Because we see that patients are ready to pay $30,000 for a car, and they're not ready to pay $6,000 for a product that would let them walk. Why? Because the, the car, they know that they have to pay, nobody will give to them. But the $6,000, they expect the insurance company to give them. And in Holland, where we uh, operate very successfully and we have full reimbursement, it's even more so. People expect that the government will give them everything for free. And if they don't get it for free, it's probably not good. That's, that's their perception. So we address the, re the rehab market in the U.S., which, as I said, is a huge market. Uh, there are about 2,000 rehab centers in the U.S. alone. And each of these rehab centers have patients 
in them for a number of weeks. So the rehab centers buy the product in order to give it to the patients while they're still there. When the patients go out from the center, they, uh, they can purchase the product and take it home with them. I beg your pardon? Okay, you know, it was left for the end. Um, production is also a major element because when you address such a huge market, as I said before, you need to have a very good production system. That's why we have Dow Chemical on our board, and they are helping us with everything that has to do with manufacturability of this product. We have sites uh, basically all over the world uh, where we develop a few of the parts uh, while we own the, the molds and the uh, tools, and then the uh, assembly is finally done here in Israel. This is a, a picture of a, of a site in Germany. And now, when, if all what I've said so far is true, I'm not saying it is, but if it is true, then we still have a major problem here. And that is, our company is located in Ranana. And Avi, head of Teuza, who is our major shareholder, is, is, is situated in Haifa. And I'm telling you that a person from Haifa and a person from Anana cannot change the world themselves. That doesn't work. That we don't have the experience to do that, and we also don't have the money to do that. It's very, very expensive to change concepts of world, especially in medical devices, where concepts are, where, where the field by definition is, is a bit more, um, more um, uh, conservative than uh, uh, the internet field, for instance, uh, because also the doctors are involved and they are very careful not to give to the patient something which they haven't tried yet, etc., etc., etc. So we brought in a, a person who is uh, one of the leading uh, entrepreneurs in the field, uh, in the medical field, and that is uh, Mr. Alfred Mann, Dr. Alfred Mann. Uh, this is a guy from California who has done this very challenge a few times already, taking a technology from an idea and making this to be a standard of care and then, of course, selling it for billions of dollars to, to the, huge, to the uh, larger companies. But you see, to do that, you don't go too early to the large companies because they don't know how to do it with you. If, you go, if we go today to a large company like Johnson & Johnson, they don't have the infrastructure to take this uh, small technology and, and make this big. You have to come to them once you already have infrastructure, people in the field, and then they know how, how to make this a division in their, in their company. So together with Alfred Mann, we established a joint venture in the US called BioNess. BioNess comes from Ness, and the Bion comes from a technology which they brought in. And basically, we join forces, the two technologies, but not only the technologies were brought together, but also the, uh, the, the as I said, there was uh, enough financial means now to do the job and enough experience by people who have done it. And uh, the technology which Alfred uh, Mann Group brought was added to the technology I've already explained to you, and that is invasive technology. The beauty about the NEST technology it is that it is non-invasive. A person can get it after 20 minutes, as I explained before, go home and start using it, point. However, there are muscles where we, you cannot address with a non-invasive technology. Uh, and that is inside muscles, inside the body, not extremities. These muscles must be addressed by implantable micro-stimulators. That is this bion. You can see the size of it. It's a very small. And the idea here is to inject it with a, uh, with a uh, needle which is uh, a bit thicker than usual needle, but you just inject this little microstimulator into the right place in the muscle, and that it does the work. But this device is very, uh, a very uh, sophisticated and very clever device. Not only that it does electrical stimulation, but it also has the ability to communicate wirelessly with the control unit, which is outside, obviously. It's like a, like a little uh, um, cell phone. And also, hundreds of these devices implanted in the body can communicate to each other. And because function involves in many, many muscles, basically you can uh, visualize a, um, a vision of a bionic person 
who has many uh, injectable devices in the right places and bringing back function to various sites of the body. And, it, by the way, it has also a battery. There is a lot of energy in, opposed to a card, uh, cardio um, uh, devices, which takes very little energy, and you can rechange the battery, as you know, only after eight years. Here, it takes a lot of energy to make the muscles work. And, um, and uh, that is why uh, the, um, uh, every, every night you can charge it via um, uh, induction from the outset. I will uh, shorten this, I just say that, by the way, uh, again, I, I'm not saying that all of what I've said so far is true, but I can only tell you that in, in our type of business, you always look for early indications that you are on the right track. And right now, we have early indications that we are on the right track because sales since 2005 are growing every year. We, multi we double the sales. Uh, we hope to double them again next year to be $25 million. And, uh, and uh, we, we see that the, um, that the uh, market likes uh, the, the product. And that's that where I would like to finish by, sh by proving this statement. When you bring a technology to this market, again, I said, you have to bring the message to millions of people. You cannot do it alone. You need one more, uh, one more uh, institution to help you, and that is the media. And the media, if you have to pay for it, it's very expensive. But if the media likes the devices, if the media likes the effect of our devices on the people, then media would pick it up by themselves and put it as a breakthrough news. And I'll show you now uh, clips which we picked out from uh, news reports all over the U.S. Uh, in the last, in the last uh, year or so. So just uh, bear, me, bear me with me for a few um, seconds and we'll see the, these clips. No, no voice. Mm -hmm. Mute. Just one second. Eleanor Kendrick's life was changed after having a new high tech tool is helping stroke patients in their recovery process. Coming up in the Health Watch, the funeral. Having a stroke can lead to loss of mobility and intense rehabilitation, trying to regain motor skills. Well, now there's a new wireless device that's giving stroke victims and those with other debilitating diseases. Eleanor Kendrick's life was changed after having a stroke in 2006. Doctors say there is now a revolutionary new technology that's putting one foot KKTV in front of the other. KKTV 11 News reporter Nicole Sulcer tells us about a device that could bring patients. The dream is to have control of her body. Now a medical miracle is making that dream a reality. Good evening, I'm Nina Spilana. And I'm John Carroll. The device that gives her this new mobility is called the Ness L3. Ramage has a rare muscular disorder. Without the device, he has difficulty walking. But check out what happens when he turns it on. Uh, gives me my total freedom back. From WATE 6, East Tennessee's first television station, this is WATE 6 News. Now, well, it is a medical breakthrough, a powerful new device that helps paralyze people walk again. Six Health Minister Lori Tucker in to show us this amazing technology. It truly is, Gene. Patricia Neal Rehab Center is the first in the state to offer what's called the BioNest device. You're looking at it here. It jump starts the feet and the legs by stimulating the nerves and muscles we all need to walk. 
Take a look at how it's helping one man from Walland. Before you see how it's helping Chuck Buchanan, we want you to see just how difficult it is for him to get around. A motorcycle accident left him with spinal cord damage. Both feet are paralyzed. As you can see, he can barely walk. But this little device called the Bioness L300 foot drop stimulator has changed Chuck's life. It doesn't have any um, wires for us to deal with, which is really nice. First, a heel switch is placed on his shoe. The switch communicates with the electrodes he straps onto his legs. And this device allows the physical therapist to program how much electric stimulation to give him. Once the stimulator is programmed, the change is nothing short of remarkable. Chuck is suddenly able to walk. Walk like just about anyone else. Remember just minutes ago, he struggled with each and every step. A lot of the patients feel like their feet are stuck to the ground, and so this kind of helps pick the feet up off the ground. Now Chuck can climb stairs, can almost touch his toes, and is reaching out too. Reaching out to say thank you to all who helped him get his life back. Without them, my life as I knew it before, it, it, it's a different life because you know I can't function the way the things I normally did and do, but with them, you know, I'm very thankful, you know, God lets everything in a place and a time. So he's unable to go up. Now Chuck hopes to go back to working in construction very soon. He'll use the foot drop stimulator at home for up to four months. It may strengthen his muscles enough that one day he won't need it at all. The device can also help people suffering strokes, MS, brain injury, and certain types of spinal cord injury as long as they can still walk somewhat. It is truly amazing. Live in the studio, Lori Tucker, 6 News. Thanks. So, uh, can, can you hear? Is this working? So clearly I'm not Nomi Bitterman. Nomi is a friend and colleague. She's really tough, but uh, she was laid low by a Hungarian version of uh, flu virus and uh, apologized last night. And so I'm going to try and, and replace her. My qualifications are zero except for one. On November 10th, I turned 65. So I'm one of those old people that she has been studying in her uh, study of designing patient-oriented e-health systems. And her work was done with Ilana Shalev, Noga Navedoich, Chaim Bitterman, and Eyal Lerner. Uh, Chaim, of course, is Naomi's husband, and Naomi herself is head of the industrial design program uh, in the Faculty of Architecture here uh, at the Technion, the faculty that, that Ron teaches in. Um, so the issue here is the crisis in healthcare, rising costs, rising number of older people, whom I am among them, and the question is how can we harness technology in order to provide some solutions? From Shmuel, I think we heard some amazing new technology. Ness means miracle in Hebrew, and that, that technology truly is miraculous. So I'm going to move ahead rather quickly and talk about Naomi's research very briefly. The idea is how can the web, the internet, be used in order to provide effective computer interfaces for the use of elderly people in providing health care. And uh, this is an experiment that Naomi has done with her colleagues that explores uh, this issue. From Rafi Bayar at Mo yesterday, we heard that most Israeli startup companies are in the area of medical devices. 
uh, Ness is, is an example. But Israel has tremendous strength in IT and software. And this is not being leveraged in the area of, uh, of healthcare. Um, so uh, possibly this is a great new direction for Israel to take our expertise in IT and software and apply it more extensively and more aggressively in the area of medical uh, devices. So here's what Naomi and her team did. They built uh, real websites for the purpose of the experiment. And then they designed an experimental methodology that would track how older people use them along with younger people as a kind of control group. Naomi comes from a background of medical research. So she was able to use some physiological me measurements as well as cognitive and perceptual measurements in trying to understand what is an effective website that would be used effectively by older people. So there were two groups of people. There were younger people and then there were older people over 65. They did have some previous uh, computer experience and there were both men and women. And they were given tasks to perform on three different websites based on real scenarios. They were given uh, some tasks to carry out. They filled out a questionnaire and then they were interviewed and asked about their experience and Naomi and her team uh, derived some conclusions based on this. And she measured the use of older people of uh, websites based on functional parameters, speed, for example, how quickly they were able to get the information and retrieve it, <coughs> subjective parameters, that's their own opinions about how they use the site, and then she used physiological parameters, um, stress measured by uh, perspiration, sweating, and heart rate to measure another aspect of, of uh, stress. These were the functional parameters, the time that it took them to do the tasks, number of steps, the number of errors that they made. Then subjective parameters, how comfortable, how easily did you use the website and your preferences. These are some of the people who used it. And then the physiological parameters, heart rate and, uh, and sweat uh, measured by skin, skin resistance. You can see this is some of the uh, complicated equipment that, that she used. Um, here are the search tasks. So there were three sites, London, Prague, and Rome. Uh, and they uh, were given the task of finding out how long would a visit take to the Columbia Road Market. In Prague, what would you pay maximally for a kilometer traveling by taxi in Prague per kilometer? And in Rome, what's the fax number of a particular hotel, fictional one hotel, Viennese du, a one-star hotel. So the young people and the old people were given the task of answering these three questions using the websites that were specifically designed for this uh, experiment. Results. Uh, the younger people took a lot more time. That's, that's clear. We, we know that. That was significant. Um, they took more time to, to find the answers. According to Nomi, they didn't make more errors, but you can see here that while the mean number of errors is not significantly different, although higher among older people. The variance is much larger. Though some old people are still very dexterous and some people uh, are not, and some people make a lot of mistakes and others very few, and there's much bigger variance among the old than, than among the young. So I'm going to skip this part and move to the general conclusions. It took more time for older people no major significant difference in number of errors, no difference in the physiological parameters. Older, uh, younger people have stress uh, as well and their heartbeat goes up when they don't get their answers, not just, not just older people. And uh, no correlation between performance and, and satisfaction. So here are the summary of results uh, that Naomi found and then I'll add a couple of my own uh, comments. Older people can perform inter tests, internet tests just as well as younger people. That just takes them a little longer. No difference in anxiety. Apparently anxiety in using the internet is common to everybody, not just age function. And uh, you can use physiological measures like heart rate and uh, skin resistance in order to understand reactions to the use of websites. 
Uh, I think this is the main conclusion of Naomi, and she has stressed this in her presentations that I've heard, and I think Ron would agree with this. The idea is not to develop websites that are specifically designed for old people and that label people as old or young. That's not the idea. The idea is that when you design the website, make it friendly, convenient, clear, simple, easy to use, so that young people and old people will use it more, will make less errors, and will take less time in extracting the information. This is what older people want, and uh, I think this is, this is what we need. Websites are often designed by very technically proficient people. And they tend to assume much more knowledge in the user than the users normally have because they themselves are very proficient because they swim in this stuff every day. Um, so the idea here is to use the principles of good design, industrial design, in designing websites so that they're easier to use, not just for older people, but for everybody. And uh, in that sense, um, we can make far more effective use of, of, of the websites. Um, so the idea is that personalizing, tailorizing interactive medical computer systems uh, can make the technology more accessible to a very large population that are, that are going to, to need this. Uh, my own comment in adding to this, uh, and I'll end here so we can have some time for discussion about the, the three very interesting papers that preceded this. Um, we've gone from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0 which is the building of networked systems, creating communities. And these communities can be tremendously important for older people in, uh, in getting medical care because older people tend to be very isolated. Isolation is one of the main problems of old age. It's not just ill health, but it's the isolation that comes with older age. And if we can use Web 2.0 to, to break this isolation and to link older people in communities, it can be a tremendous breakthrough. Um, I, I find it uh, interesting that most of the Web 2.0 breakthrough products, YouTube, Facebook, all of these things, they're, they're designed for younger people, and they've caught on tremendously among younger people. But there's a huge market out there. Where are the entrepreneurs uh, using Web 2.0? And now we have Web 3.0, which is the next stage of the Internet, where are these entrepreneurs identifying this enormous market, this enormous opportunity to link older people, to get information, medical care to them uh, using the, the wonders of, of internet technology? What's it called? Great. Good news. Thank you. Started. Uh, can I ask uh, Ron, come on, stay here, Shlomo, uh, God, Shmoli. And uh, we started five minutes late, so we'll add five minutes before the break, or we'll hopefully we'll catch up later. And uh, just to take some places. And uh, open for discussion. We had four extremely interesting presentations here. They all added something. And um, now it's your turn. I think the order of the lectures was superb because we begin with something that presented it more strategically. But I would like to refer to one of the issues. I think one of the main slides was the, was the slide of the global innovation issues. And uh, what I lacked over there were two issues. If we add what we heard today and yesterday. I think one of the global innovation issues should also call upon service, which did not appear there. The issue of service is one of the main issues I see for innovation. The other issue I would like to point is the issue of management, especially of global management, whether if it is subcontracting manager, outsourcing manager, or partnership management. It was also referred to in the other lectures and partially in this lecture. And I would like to end by referring to the lecture, I think the wonderful lecture of Ron, and it reminded me of one of the movies all of us saw probably a long time ago. James Dean, most, most famous uh, movie, I think was called uh, Young Forever. So actually what we're presenting now is the same concentration camp for people 
but it turns to be around the age of 50. So we can use here education, but in contrary to what was said yesterday, education of the customers, we're speaking here of education of the manufacturers, of the designers, because they will enter this concentration camp very soon if they will not prepare for it, the same as the president, James Dean, played, entered at the age of 25, which is the law that he insisted upon. Morning. Uh, great presentations. I just wanted to ask about the last presentation with uh, Nomi Substitute. Um, the uh, you showed research, and then the conclusions were actually somewhat unrelated to the actual research uh, shown. Did you do any tests of various designs, how they would benefit uh, populations? what parameters should be stressed in design of websites for better accessibility, etc. Nomi's done a lot of work on that, and uh, she has a whole team working on it. They've worked on areas related to uh, nutrition. But I think just trying to simplify for a non-technical person, I think her findings are that good website design is good website design whether it's for older people or younger people or, or anybody. Simplicity, clarity, ease of use, user friendliness. Um, these are all things that aren't related to older people, but are just related to good web website design. They happen to impact older people more because older people have more troubles overcoming them. complicated for others. There's, uh, you know, besides uh, things like larger fonts and uh, less words per page and stuff like that, which are kind of obvious, what you said is very true. I mean, a lot of the younger generation is designing the instruments uh, that, uh, and this was also in uh, your lecture, the, the younger uh, engineers are designing this. Uh, they have no experience being old. And so things that look obvious to them, they, they, they would argue with you that what I did was very simple. It's very of course. easy to use. They need, so to the take a course, is, they need to take a course from Ron, and they need to listen to Einstein, who said uh, simplify as much as possible, but not more so. Uh, Thanks. I'd like to add, I'd like to add please. Uh, First of all, uh, Naomi, who was also my student, and it gives me great satisfaction to see that, that uh, she's taking on. Uh, there was obviously a lot of work that has been done which is beyond larger fonts and, and more contrast. Uh, for instance, what would be the best way to construct a list, vertical or, or horizontal? So the whole process is uh, done by first making assumption on the basis of knowledge, creating experiments, and then of course doing the whole work of analyzing and, and running statistics and getting to the, to the right conclusions. And uh, there's a lot, a lot, I mean, if you're interested, there's a lot of uh, works that have been done which are in our library, especially about uh, web uh, websites and, and elderly. And of course, the whole web is full of it. Yeah, I think about this on a personal basis. fantastic on computers and uh, and I'll call her up and I'll say Rebecca um, how do you do this that and the other when you see this and she says I explained that to you last time a year ago <laughs> so uh, would Nomi's team undertake to evaluate designs or implementations for suitability to older people I suppose there are uh, proper technical channels to uh, to deal with that. Okay. So, I suggest you contact her, and she, we will be very pleased to do that. Can I add the? There's a. Okay. The uh, the uh, the Gertner, Motke uh, Shani, who uh, is a professor, he headed the Shiva. Uh, is now heading the Gertner Institute for National uh, Health Policy. 
uh, abducted me to a group of, uh, that really focuses on tele-rehab. Uh, and one of the issues, I mean, the issues that people talked about come very vividly into that. Uh, the, all the people behave differently, and there were references to the uh, user interface design. There's a, in the IT tradition, you know, the, we've been spending about 25, 26 years. There's a huge literature on, the, uh, on methodologies. And methodology is required because people assume that the world is themselves. Okay, and, uh, and that is the common mistake. And so you need to have discipline to go and find out what really people are doing. And the other group that I'm, other project that I'm doing now is uh, looks at television technology. And uh, my grandmother, Pnina, has become a, a legendary example of, of, of technology usage because she was calling a technician every time that Chaim Yavin didn't show up on the screen. So for her, there was a single channel. I mean, eventually what I did, I taped her a, a remote control with two buttons open, on and off, and volume, because she didn't hear it that well. So that, that's comment number one. There was a comment about the uh, uh, service. Service is even more important in the global scene because it, is it could be digitized more easily. Everything, I mean, being digital means you can transfer that anywhere in the world. One of the issues is to look at what you do and chop it into the digital part and the non-digital part. And, and you, I mean, as we see today, the, lots of examples of the things like personal assistance. I mean, the, the, the fashion now is to have an Indian personal assistant that orders you a place in the restaurant, that does your shopping, that orders everything that they need all the way from Bangalore to your, uh, to your neighborhood in New York. Okay? Because being there is physical. Order, getting in touch and so on is digital. So if you think globally, one thing you have to ask yourself, what is information based and what is physical? So, I think that what is forgotten here, that people need the uh, uh, services also for contact, for personal contact. And this is something we should not forget, that even if an elderly wants to buy something or to contact something or to get something, and can get very easily on the web or whatever, press a button and he gets it done. He doesn't want to hear beep, you can press one for this and this. Beep, you can press two to get to this person. And you know, a lot of us can stay on the phone for like five minutes being transferred by the numbers just to get a person to talk or not. So the personal contact is very, very important, especially for the elderly. That's what I think, so. Since we were talking about uh, usability, I would like to take the opportunity to tell the people, the audience here, about uh, standards, standardizations, uh, about uh, usability of medical devices as well as other uh, uh, subjects. There is now a committee in the Israeli Institute of Standards uh, for usability, and one of the projects is uh, a uh, running project now is uh, of uh, sound alarms of uh, medical devices, how to use, uh, how to design the alarms so that uh, people or nurses will distinguish between uh, different, different kinds of uh, alerts. And uh, I uh, challenge everybody here 
who want to contribute to the standardization of uh, medical devices to contact me because I am uh, the chair of this uh, committee and of the usability committee. Thank you. We just made that again. We have. I will close this wonderful session with a little personal experience that integrates all the things we just talked about. Years ago, I used to do a lot of work in Kenya, and they had a lousy telephone system on there. And some, and I was telling people like, we have trouble getting a, a, a number. And so they said, ah, you have to use the new technology we have. I said, what's that? They said, it's these new Pakistani dialers. So I thought, oh, that's wonderful. And I had an image of a box, you know, and you had a number. And so I said, well, how do I get one? They said, we'll call him in. It was this Pakistani guy that would sit there all day and the number. So he came through the combination of <laughs> but thanks very much, I want to speak, and uh, we will resume, um, let's say here, at 20 past, okay? We'll make that happen. Thank you.